So I obtained my Bachelor's of Science degree from Tsinghua University in about 1996, um, and then uh, actually 2000, from 1996 to 2000. And then I went to University of Wisconsin-Madison uh, to obtain a PhD in pharmacology. And afterwards, I decided to do something more translational, and maybe I uh, want to touch the life of patients instead of doing basic research. So that's why I went to uh, UCSF for a postdoctoral research in clinical chemistry. And after that, I obtained board certification by American Board of Clinical Chemistry in three different specialties, clinical chemistry, molecular diagnostics, and uh, toxicological chemistry. I'm also a fellow of National Academy of Clinical Biochemistry uh, in the US. So um, as I mentioned before, I'm a medical director of clinical chemistry and also overseeing point of care testing at Houston Methodist Hospital. Uh, my experience are mostly focused on uh, directing and managing high complexity CLIA labs, which is a uh, regulation focused on clinical lab operation in the United States. So specialty is uh, CLIA regulations, lab management to drive clinical efficiency, quality and outcome, clinical asset development, as well as optimization. So here's a little bit of background about the hospital I work in here. Uh, Houston Methodist Hospital is uh, about a 900-bed hospital in the center of Texas Medical Center. So it's world's largest medical center uh, located, as I said, in Houston. In a very small area, you have a high concentration of academic institutions as well as healthcare institutions, including many hospitals, as well as uh, teaching and educational facilities uh, such as MD Anderson, Rice University, and Baylor College of Medicine. So we're one of them. And then uh, it's actually a healthcare system. If you look at the whole system, we have about over 2,000 beds uh, combined because there was one hospital in the Texas Medical Center, and then there's also other six community hospitals in the suburb areas. So um, I know people from China will say, well, 2,000 beds, that's a small hospital in the uh, China country. But however, you know, in the United States, that's regarded as a pretty sizable hospital system. So um, it's U.S. News rated as number one in Texas hospitals in all the specialties. And then academically, it's affiliated, as I mentioned before, with Well Cornell Medical College in New York. Uh, so I put several pictures here. Uh, um, so here is on the left, lower hand here, you can see a picture of the Texas Medical Center. And here is the Houston Methodist Hospital that I work in. The hospital also had some research and teaching functions, so that's why we have a brand new building here, a very nice modern building dedicated to research only, so that's a research institute. So um, before I uh, delve into the topic of point of care testing, I would like to focus on why we think point of care, next generation point of care testing especially, is important to us. So to answer that question, I think we have to focus on big picture here. So here we, we uh, would like to focus on big picture from two different countries, United States and China. So let's start with U.S. If you look at the big picture of U.S. healthcare spending, uh, we know that the payers uh, which uh, give reimbursements to healthcare providers uh, from the government side include Medicare and Medicaid. So if you are over 65 years of age, uh, you will be uh, receiving Medicare from government and your health care expenses will be covered by that. And the Medicaid covers people who, um, whose uh, income are below the poverty level and uh, then some uh, other uh, disabled personnel as well. And then the other maybe 60 to 70 percent of people are covered by private insurance companies. So if you are employed, like me, uh, if I work for the hospital, then I buy insurance from your employer, and then uh, those are paid through the private insurance companies. So we know that this is a pretty fragmented uh, market because in the United States there are many different private insurance companies. And then about five years ago, uh, President Obama started a healthcare reform. So one of the goals for healthcare reform was to um, combine all these payers into a single payer, maybe a national government payer. However, you know, politically, because of various reasons, that never actually uh, became the reality in the United States. However, till today, there is still efforts going on to try to realize single payer system in different states, because we know that in the US, the states have some uh, autonomy uh, as compared to the federal government. So uh, that is still ongoing, such as in Vermont. 
and we are really waiting to see how that works out. And then one of the big issues for U.S. healthcare is their high healthcare spending. So in 2013, we can see that the figure for uh, healthcare spending is about 17 to 18 percent of uh, national GDP in the United States. So that's a pretty high number. And then that number continues to grow by 4 to 6 percent every year and faster than the rate the GDP is growing. It's estimated by that by the year of 2022, that number is going to be about one-fifth or 20 percent of GDP. So that means about one-fifth of what you uh, produce is going to be spent on health care. That's a lot of money. So where do those money go? If you look at the pie chart here on the right side, you can see that um, the hospitals actually occupy a, about 30 percent, well, one-third of the um, health care cost. And then the rest of them, about one-fifth, uh, what 20 percent is spent on physician health care givers. And then there is prescription drugs as well, which is a big component. And then the other small fragments, uh, various uh, different health care providers. And clinical lab definitely is one of them. So if we look at the clinical diagnostic market in U.S., it's about $74 billion, or about 3 percent of this big pie chart here. So it's a small amount, actually, compared to the whole uh, health care cost in the United States. However, this very small investment actually uh, gives a big impact to health care because about 70 percent of all the clinical decisions uh, is based on the uh, clinical lab testing result. So it's a, very, um, it's a very important industry, and I believe that investment is well worth uh, the return. So as I mentioned before, one of the biggest uh, challenge uh, in the U.S. for healthcare is how to spend the spending curve. If you look at the curve here, the top one is the U.S. spending. Uh, it's much higher than any of the developed countries here, uh, as I shown uh, in the graph. And if you look at per capita spending, the United States people spend about 9,000 U.S. dollars per person per year on their healthcare cost. So that's a lot of money given by the income level uh, in the United States. Then let's turn our eye um, onto China and look at the big picture of China healthcare. So what about um, the unique challenges in China? I'm sure and that's very different from the U.S. So in China, the figures in 2013 is that the healthcare spending total is about 3,000 uh, Chinese RMB billion. And then about 5.6% uh, of GDP is spent on health care. So as we can see, and that's much lower than the United States, about 17% at uh, currently level. So you can see on the graph here on the lower right side, you can see that uh, percentage also keeps increasing as well, but it's still kept at a relatively low level. And per capita, uh, Chinese people spend about 2,000 or maybe yuan per person per year on their health care needs. And then we know that most of our uh, population is covered by uh, government uh, insurance, or what we call uh, There are some commercial health insurance companies growing, trying to push that and um, sort of go after the same model in the United States. But uh, as we can see, they're still in their infant stage right now at this uh, moment. So what is the unique challenge in China healthcare? We know that spending at this time is not a challenge in China. The unique challenge is how to get access to medicine and diagnostics for many, many different patients in China. We know that our population is huge. So if you look at the number of hospitals in China, it's uh, classified into three different tiers. So we know that Sanji Yuan or Sanji Jiadeng Yuan, which is the best of all the hospitals regarded as the best of hospitals in China. So the number in uh, our country is about 1,000 of them. All over the country is uh, Sanjia Yuan. And when people get sick, then naturally they want to seek the best expertise. And that's why they all go to Sanjia Yuan, which creates a phenomenon called Yiliao Yongji. As you can see in the picture here, that's probably a scene that you can see every day in every Sanjia hospital in the country. So this uh, brings us to the question, how do we uh, get every uh, person in this picture, they all access to medicine and diagnostics as fast as possible and at uh, a low uh, cost 
as low cost as possible so that they can benefit from uh, health care. And the third challenge, as we can see, which is common to both U.S. and China, is how to increase healthcare efficiency and outcome. So here is a very interesting plot, which uh, on the x-axis you can see is the healthcare spending per capita, which we know for the U.S. is about 9,000, and for the, uh, China is much lower. Um, if you look at the U.S. dollar, then it's less than probably uh, 200 U.S. dollars. So U.S. is here, but if you can see on um, the y-axis is the life expectancy in years. The U.S. people do not have very high life expectancies. So it's probably below uh, 80 years for U.S. And for China, our spot is here. So again, our investment on healthcare is uh, low. However, our life expectancy is also lower too. So the challenge common to both countries is how do we get both countries here to this corner so that we're in here together with many different countries like Korea and other developed countries so that we have a relatively low healthcare spending but our people have um, very high life expectancy. So this brings me to our topic which, which is next generation of point of care. My belief is that next generation point of care can actually help us to meet uh, these challenges I mentioned before. So I believe that the promise here include uh, point of care generation can improve wellness and increase access to diagnostics, improve chronic disease monitoring, improve cancer monitoring, decrease healthcare spending, and increase healthcare uh, efficiency as well. So I would like to show this to you because I really believe it's a prototype of the next generation point of care. So it's called uh, Qualcomm Tricolor X Prize. So two different foundations. Qualcomm is actually a company uh, based on um, focusing on communication and IT. And there is another foundation called X Foundation. They come together and bring up this uh, X Prize and challenge uh, uh, internationally that if a company can come up with a, something like a tricorder, I don't know if you are familiar with tricorder, but it's a device used, showing the picture here, used a lot in the uh, movie Star Wars. Uh, as you can see, uh, it's held in the palm of the character and it can be used frequently to diagnose disease for many of the characters in the movie. So um, the foundations come together and challenge international companies say that if you can come up with a device that's uh, acting like tricorder, then we'll give you 10 million US dollars. So what's the requirement of this device? It has to be wireless, uh, it's portable and weigh less than five pounds and also uh, accurately diagnose uh, about 13 core health conditions as listed here. And then out of the elective health conditions, you can also choose about three of them. So combined together, you have to be able to diagnose about 16 healthcare conditions and also monitor five vital signs such as blood pressure, heart rate, oxygen, and respiration rate, etc. So the prize was launched in January 2012. And by 2014, August, um, 10 uh, finalist teams uh, globally have been selected to compete for the final prize. And then we're really waiting anxiously to hear uh, by January of next year, the final, uh, the awardee will be announced. So it's very interesting. And I believe it, re it really represents the, uh, the um, uh, best of the next generation point of care testing. So, um, and then in the following slides, I will uh, walk you through um, some of the bullet points uh, here and then talk about uh, why uh, I think next generation point of care testing will have these promises. So first of all, improve wellness. I believe uh, Dr. Kang uh, from uh, Tiantan Hospital also uh, touched upon this. So the prototype for wellness point of care testing uh, is wearable technology, as we all know. Uh, we have uh, Fitbit, which is a, a, a real example from the U.S. company. But then here in China, we also have many different types like Xiaomi Shouhuan. And then we have many things like this that can uh, record our, uh, for example, uh, exercise, our activity levels, and also record our sleep patterns. And then uh, another very good example we all know is the Apple uh, Watch. So as shown here, which uh, started to be sold uh, at least in the United States uh, about several months ago. And now on Apple Watch, there is an uh, app called Health Kit that you can use to achieve the same means as uh, some of the uh, wearable technologies we show here. 
uh, only about last month, in May of 2015, there was a wearable World Congress uh, going on in San Francisco. I was told this is a relatively new conference because it hasn't been um, uh, conducted for only several years. But then it has uh, grown very rapidly. So I've shown you here some of the speaker uh, listed here um, full of uh, very young and promising uh, startup companies uh, and then uh, promising uh, speakers as well. So we know that we can gather lots of data from wearable technologies. However, the challenges here is how do we translate many of these real-time health data into behavior changes for the patients or for general public so that we can achieve better health condition and then also we can achieve better outcome in healthcare. And that's still a question remaining to be answered to uh, realize the full potential of these wearable technologies. And then finally, uh, how do we uh, ensure the data security and the HIPAA compliance so that the transmission of these data from wearable devices is safe and effective and our privacy is protected? That's another uh, question that needs to be answered. So the second uh, promise is that the increased uh, access to diagnostics. So I give you some examples here. Um, one of the first examples was, uh, was a device from Intermountain Medical Center in Utah. And you can see you have a smartphone cortisol test by which you can just put the test uh, onto the smartphone and then you have a cartridge here. You can put your saliva on the cartridge and then the cortisol level will be read by the smartphone and will be displayed. And similarly, you have a smartphone conjugated HIV and syphilis uh, testing and I believe Dr. Liu talked about his wonderful device, uh, which is similar to this, that can do HIV viral load testing as well. And then another device, similarly, you can do um, your glucose monitoring on, a, on an iPhone, uh, and then through the app, you can actually read your glucose level, which is a very convenient tool for many diabetes patients. A company called uh, Cambridge Consultants uh, came up with such an idea called Flow Health Hub, so as you can see, it's a round instrument. It looks kind of like a vacuum. And then you can insert different cartridges into the uh, instrument here. And many of these, on many of the cartridges, you can conduct many routine uh, clinical chemistry tests, such as sodium electrolytes and then enzyme assays as well. And then these uh, instruments will then transmit your data remotely uh, to uh, your physician. And if intervention is necessary, then that can be done as well. And then that, uh, let's go to the next bullet point, which is chronic disease monitoring. So here is a very good example, uh, which has been approved by US FDA, called a cardio MAMS device, remote heart failure diagnosis. So we know that for patients who had a heart failure um, history, it's very important to monitor them uh, very real time and frequently, so that if the next heart failure comes, then the intervention can be done rapidly. So here you can see there is an electronic sensor in the middle of the device, and this is inserted into the patient's pulmonary artery by a very thin catheter or wall uh, conjugated to the wireless uh, electronic sensor. So once inside the patient's body, this will transmit the signal uh, real time and continuously to a device uh, by the patient's bedside. As you can see showing the picture here, uh, is called patient electronic system. And this system will then process the signal and then send the data to the physician. And once the physician sees a uh, pattern uh, abnormality for, from the pressure, then they can intervene and then bring the patients to the hospital right away. Another very interesting uh, point of care device and the stage which is still in research, uh, it's uh, implanted cells rather than device. So some uh, implanted cells are conjugated with a synthetic pH sensor and then this can be implanted into uh, either animal or the patients. And then once inside, the pH sensor in the cells actually monitor the pH of the patient's blood continuously. So we know that one of the risks for patients with type, type 1 diabetes is that they may experience ketoacidosis, which will bring the pH down. If that happens, then the pH sensor from the cells will be able to detect that and then alert the physician. And what's cool about this is that not only can it detect, but also it can intervene at the same time because the cells are built with the capacity to produce insulin if the pH is low. So and that's very interesting because you combine therapeutics and diagnostics into one device at the same time. 
So at this time, this is still in experimental stage in animal studies, but I believe uh, it's very promising to proceed to human clinical trials. So then I will uh, talk about improvement uh, of cancer monitoring by point of care. So we know that Google uh, is, a, uh, is a very big company, and they have a division called Google X, which focuses on many cool next generation technologies, including, for example, electronic cars and the healthcare related applications. So one of their projects is to develop ingestible nanoparticles. So as you, sh uh, you can see here in the picture, you have nanoparticles on the surface of which you conjugate or coat different antigens that are specific for uh, things that you want to monitor. For example, you can uh, select to monitor sodium, or you can select to monitor real-time cancer cells uh, with antigens specific for cancers. So once you ingest these nanoparticles into the body, they will travel through your body and monitor the analytes in real time. And then what's cool about this is that uh, these are also magnetic nanoparticles. So you can wear, a, uh, for example, a, um, um, a, a wristband. And this uh, will attract nanoparticles back to one single place, such as your wrist. And then you can look at the concentration of these analytes you want to monitor in real time. Similarly, in Israel, uh, they have developed gold nanoparticles to detect the cancers of tongue and the larynx. So uh, these are nanoparticles that can be used in mouth rinsing. And then once you rinse your mouth, then the gold nanoparticles can detect cancer specific with uh, cancer specific antibodies can detect in these cancers. So these uh, are called molecular imaging and they avoid many of the radiation side effects that are typically required for cancer detection. And similarly, University of Washington, they have a very small point of care device uh, which is essentially a microfluidic chip on the surface of which they have built microfluidic channels and then you can flow biopsy tissues through these channels, channels to uh, detect the presence of pancreatic cancer. So, um, in my opinion, I really see the following trends in the next generation point of care testing. So the first is towards non-invasiveness and then real time, all the data are being transmitted real time and then increasingly, it's being tailored to individual needs so that uh, personalized or precision medicine can be achieved. And then I also uh, increasingly seeing application of genomics in point of care testing as well. And that brings the, uh, the requirement for increased capacity in data connectivity. And then finally, it's being increasingly used in telemedicine as well. So, um, so the first bullet point here, non-invasiveness. So there are two examples that I gave you here. One of them is called a glucolyte glucometer. So as we all know, uh, if we use current point of care testing glucometers, then you have to use your finger stick uh, blood and then uh, insert that into a cartridge to get your blood glucose level. However, here is a very novel device. Uh, it has a membrane on the surface of which it has uh, special dye molecules called spiropyrins. So these molecules will change their conformation under different lights, either UV lights or visible lights. So when the conformation of the molecules is changed, then the permeability of the membrane is changed at the same time. So if you put a device on your skin, for example, on your arm, then the blood glucose uh, from under your skin in the capillary blood will permeate through these membrane, very cool technology, into the device itself and then get measured in the device. So this is a very interesting device because you no longer even need a drop of blood. Currently, it's uh, being uh, tested in clinical trials. And another very interesting device, which I think has a high promise in point of care testing, is a device called Hemolink. So the Hemolink uh, is a device to collect the blood. So we know that to collect the blood, usually classically, you have to use a finger stick or even vein puncture. So here, you have a device that uses vacuum to collect blood. If you put the device on your arm, then the device will generate vacuum, and through the vacuum, blood will uh, diffu diffuse from under your skin to the collection tube here. So this tube of blood can then be used very conveniently for many point of care uh, applications, or even can be shipped to the labs in the hospital for central lab diagnostics. And then increased application of genomics so here I give you an example uh, which looks really like a mini USB drive here uh, and has USB connection to a laptop. However, it's actually a, a single molecule sensor uh, analyzer. 
So on the surface of this, uh, they have built microfluidic channels, and you can uh, directly apply patient sample, either blood or saliva or urine, onto the uh, surface here, and then it can achieve single molecule analysis, including single molecule DNA sequencing or other proteomic uh, applications. So very cool technology as well, and I believe very promising in the next generation point of care. And then, so we have generated lots of data in a next generation point of care. What about uh, the disposal of these data? What are we going to do with it? So and that brings me to the issue of data connectivity. So um, in January of 2015, the US FDA actually uh, permits or approved the marketing of the first system of mobile uh, medical apps for continuous glucose monitoring data sharing. That's a very long sentence, I apologize for that. But essentially what that means is that uh, before, uh, if you, knew, if you uh, upload your glucose uh, data to a mobile phone, your smartphone, you can only share that with your physician, your doctor. But now you can actually share that with another uh, non-physician individual, such as your friend or your uh, parents. So this is very convenient for many uh, parents with uh, diabetes kids because they can actually see their kids' glucose levels in real time. And this actually paved the way for many of the medical applications in the future as well. And we know that Apple is a big company uh, that focuses on IT. They have recently announced partnerships with Epic, which is a company, uh, one of the largest ones that manufacture and sell uh, hospital-based electronic medical record systems. So they have come together and decided to develop uh, data flow from their apps uh, on the iPhone to my chart, which is a patient-oriented interface for their lab result viewing, uh, and that's from Epic. So this shows that there is industry uh, common um, co uh, consideration and agreement that uh, in the future, data should flow, be able to flow wirelessly and in a uh, privacy competent manner from uh, smartphones to uh, patient portals or electronic medical systems. So this, uh, this ensures that all these apps have to uh, be compliant with HIPAA, which is Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act, which is the law in the United States to govern Patient Privacy Act. So as I mentioned before, we have apps and platforms available that are compliant, uh, compliant with HIPAA, so the data connectivity is really not a big issue here. And finally, I want to talk about application of point of care in telemedicine. So um, I believe most of us have heard about Google Glass. So Google Glass um, has been developed in Google for some years now, and then uh, at least before last year, there was still um, selling these to individual consumers. However, um, since last year, Google has decided to shift their focus and, uh, and refocus the application of Google Glass to commercial or business applications, including the healthcare applications. So some of the um, applications for Google Glass include you can diagnose conditions remotely and then transmit that, that diagnosis remotely to the EMR system. And then you can also, um, for the anesthesiologist during surgery, then they can view the patient's status uh, hands-free while they're operating on the patients. If the patients are being transmitted from uh, you know, home to uh, the hospital in an ambulance, then it's very convenient for the uh, ambulance staff to use Google Glass to transmit the patients, maybe take a video of the patients or pictures and transmit that information to the ER emergency room staff or the specialists. And then finally, you can use even the um, primary care physicians can use Google Glass to enter data wirelessly into the electronic medical records during uh, their patient care uh, episodes. And what I'm interested in, uh, what I find really attractive is uh, such a device called auto, uh, the cell scope, smartphone autoscope. So uh, this is essentially a point of care device that you can attach to any of your smartphones. And then uh, any of us with small children know that one of the big uh, risks in small children is ear infection. So when they're young, they are very prone to ear infections, and when that happens, then you have to know whether there's a bacterial infection, and if so, then antibiotics should be uh, given very quickly to them, which will control the infection very quickly. So what, as a parent, what do we do? 
uh, when I suspect my child to have a ear infection, then the United States have to call to make a patient, uh, to make a doctor's appointment to see the pediatrician. And that usually takes about um, one or two days before I can see the doctor. And doctor usually takes about five minutes to diagnose and give me a prescription, which I take back and then fill the prescription. And then in the China, similarly, if a parent uh, suspect that his child is crying because uh, there is a ear infection, then they have to rush to the uh, nearest pediatric hospital and then to um, you know, uh, lie in the many, uh, among many different patients uh, in the crowds in the pediatric hospital before they can see the patient, they can see the doctor. So none of these solutions is very convenient and very timely. However, if you can use this autoscope then you can actually insert into your child's ear canal and then take a video of the inside of the ear and then you can transmit that video wirelessly to a doctor uh, through the app on the phone. And then that doctor can, based on the video, make a diagnosis and then can also transmit the prescription back to you uh, in a very short amount of time. So it's actually a very um, relatively low expense uh, device Currently in the United States, it's only available in California at about $79. But I really think it's a revolutionized um, uh, device that can uh, solve a big issue uh, all over the country. Uh, and then finally, uh, we uh, look at Rite Aid, which is a, um, a chain um, pharmacy in the United States. So they have uh, installed these telemedicine kiosks in their pharmacies to help uh, to help implement telemedicine. So if you walk into uh, these telemedicine kiosks, if you have a cold or flu or sometimes minor injury, then you can go there and initiate an episode with some of the famous doctors in the, race, in the uh, nearby hospitals and then get diagnosed. And then um, I really see a lot of application of point of care devices in these kiosks because again, you need a quick diagnosis and you need accurate diagnosis. So you can, in these cubicles here, you can see, you can put many of the device, including point of care devices here, uh, which well is a key component of telemedicine. And similarly, Mail Clinic, which we know is a, a world famous healthcare organization, uh, has installed these kind of kiosks uh, for their employees, as well in the local primary uh, elementary schools for the kids for telemedicine uh, implementation. So I really think this is a uh, uh, synchronizing effort and all the trends are pointing towards the increased application of point of care testing. So this brings me to the question uh, which I would like to pose to the audience as well. So we have talked about many cool technologies. However, is technology advanced the uh, bitter pill that can cure all the diseases? I think the answer is probably no, and I think you probably agree with me. So one of the um, journalists and uh, also entrepreneur, uh, his name is uh, Stephen Briel, actually wrote an article about this. So he had his open heart surgery in 2014, and subsequent to that, he had some insights into the United States healthcare system, and therefore published article, a well, a widespread article uh, called What I Learned from My 190,000 Open Heart Surgery on the Time Magazine, uh, which was discussed a lot among the healthcare community. And then uh, subsequent to that in 2015, he published a book, book called America's Bitter Pill, which uh, focused a lot on the healthcare system in general and described the uh, process of healthcare reform, uh, which is a book that I recommend you to read if you're interested in this topic. So here is one paragraph from, from his article. In the beginning, I won't read all of these, but in the beginning, uh, he mentioned about how much uh, uh, healthcare uh, spending and investment the United States have made on their healthcare system, uh, but the reality, the outcome isn't optimal. So, in the last sentence here, he talked about healthcare uh, technology advance. He said, All those high tech advances, pacemakers, MRIs, 3D mammograms have produced an upside down healthcare marketplace. It's the only industry in which technolo technological advances have increased the costs instead of lowering them. So this actually echoes with my previous point that technology advance is not the only answer that can help address all the challenges we face today in healthcare. So what are the challenges? At the same time, we really view these challenges as opportunities because that provides you with uh, some chance to address and meet them. 
So the first challenge I really see for the next generation point of care is how do we ensure the quality of results? How do we make sure the results are accurate and how do we make sure they are reproducible? Uh, in our clinical chemistry jargon, how do we ensure that uh, the precision and accuracy is good? And then how do we uh, assure the uh, data transmission is HIPAA compliant? As I mentioned before, we actually have uh, solutions to address that, so this has been taken care of. And then in both countries, in either US FDA or CFDA, how do we ensure there is a valid and uh, a smooth pathway, regulatory pathway, to approve these uh, next generation devices? And then again, for these large amounts of individualized data, how do we translate them into unique uh, patient outcome uh, improvements rather than just stay as a large group of data? And then finally, uh, when we give the uh, authority of healthcare to the hands of individuals, uh, becomes increasingly as healthcare in becomes increasingly as a um, consumable product. So the question is, when uh, is clinical expertise needed uh, for interpretation and follow up on these data? When should we intervene, and when should we give the uh, authority to uh, the patients themselves? So uh, in the next following slides, I will talk briefly about how um, I, my approach to address these challenges and opportunities. And I believe in your audience, everybody probably has a different view and has uh, his or her unique approach to address these challenges. And to me, as I uh, am a clinical chemist, I'm also a researcher, so my approach uh, to address is to help translate many of these new research technologies into clinical tools and, uh, and towards the goal of improving efficiency and outcome. So I will talk about two different projects. One is the microfluidic volumetric bar chart chip, or V-chip, and the other is real-time monitoring using MEDIC. So the volumetric bar chart chip is a microfluid device next generation point of care that I collaborate with uh, another um, investigator, uh, Li Dongqing, in the uh, Houston Methods Research Institute. So this is founded by the National Institute of Health. So here really you see a, uh, two pieces of glass slides on the surface which you etched uh, different microfluidic channels. And you can load patient samples directly onto these slides and get real-time uh, readout of the results by naked eye. So the features are portable, low cost, little sample required, equipment free, quantitative, and same time you can achieve multiple plex uh, testing at the same time. So routinely, if you have to do lab testing, then we think about you have to do a vinipuncture on the patients, and then that tube of blood will be transmitted um, to a core lab uh, and be done on high throughput instrumentation in core lab here. So we want to change this. We want to change this to a point of care setting. So here is why we, use, we can use a drop of finger stick blood and then apply that to the V-chip device, and then you can actually get a readout uh, such as the uh, bar chart here. And then you can, nakedly, uh, using naked eye, you can read our results. And you can also take a picture of that. If you want the doctor to read the results, then you can take a picture and then upload uh, into the cloud database and transmit that to the physician. So the total time takes about five minutes, and you can measure about up to 50 biomarkers in the same time. So our specific project uh, focused on uh, detecting point-of-care drugs of abuse. So as we can see here, we can use either the patient's uh, urine or blood, and we can detect many different drugs at the same time, for example, amphetamine, uh, cocaine, uh, ben benzodiazepine, uh, and then uh, methadone, uh, PCP, et cetera. So the many routine, about seven to nine different drugs we uh, routinely detect in the clinical lab can be done at the same time on this piece of uh, equipment. And then you can also build in at the same time quality controls to ensure the quality of the results. So here is a more um, technical slide focusing on how the uh, chips work. Basically, you have two pieces of glass slides uh, on which you have microfluidic channels, and then you can load a uh, patient sample. Uh, you also have red ink, uh, you have ELISA reagents, and hydrogen peroxide. So once you slide the two pieces of glass, then ELISA reaction will occur, which will uh, generate oxygen from a uh, catalysis of hydrogen peroxide breakdown. And that oxygen will help push the red dye in here to uh, uh, up onto the microfluidic channels, which will form a bar chart uh, you can actually read by your naked eye. So as an example here, you can see the bar chart chip here. 
So we did some uh, um, improvement of the bar chart chip because we know that drugs of abuse detecting is mostly a, qu a qualitative testing. So we, uh, we actually revised the chip so that it's a more visual qualitative result. So here, if you can load the patient sample on it, if the patient is positive for a drug, for, for example, uh, amphetamine, then you can see the bar chart actually goes upward. So the upward bar chart means the patient is positive and the downward chart means the patient is negative. So that's more uh, intuitive to many of the healthcare providers, such as nurses. Um, and then here are some real uh, examples uh, of how the data look like on the VID chip. And then the second project I'm gonna briefly talk about is uh, real-time monitoring using MEDIC. So MEDIC stands for Microfluidic Electrochemical Detector for in vivo continuous monitoring. So it's a project I collaborate with a company in San Diego called Aptitude Medical Systems. Uh, we are about to get funding from NIH for a small business innovation research grant. So here essentially it's a device that you can connect to the patient's uh, blood, sorry about that, uh, to the patient's blood here via the catheter. And then the blood will uh, flow continuously through the device and then in the interim, the blood will be, the analyzing the blood which you are interested in, in this case in our project, would be propofol, which is uh, anesthetic used a lot by the um, um, surgeons or anesthesiologists during operation. So propofol will be able to be monitored by a special coded aptomer on the surface of the device. And then that will give you a real-time readout of the propofol concentration in the patient's blood. So by using this way, the uh, anesthesiologist actually can view the propofol concentration in the patient's blood in real time and continuously during surgery, and therefore they can minimize the adverse effect um, caused by overdose or underdose, for example. So here just shows the, um, the aptomer uh, generation uh, process. All right, so um, why am I here? So I showed you uh, the big picture, and also I talked about some unique uh, projects we're conducting. So I'm here because we, uh, we, uh, I, want, I want to propose that we should meet the challenges and opportunities together for next generation point of care testing. So if you are academic institutions or hospitals, then I welcome collaboration from you because we can generate ideas and uh, we can uh, share our best clinical uh, practice and then we can collaborate with uh, projects, um, projects or grants. If you are IVD vendors or manufacturers, then I think there is more things we can do. So I show you here a process of product development on IVD. So we can work together in the beginning here where we generate ideas for product specification uh, for diagnostic tar targets uh, drawn from my clinical chemistry expertise and we can develop a platform together. And then once we have a pro prototype, then we can work in a clinical lab together to generate proof of principle and then lab and field evaluation. And then that will help hopefully to uh, go through either US FDA or CFDA uh, approval and submission. And finally, if we have a proof product, then uh, I can provide clinical chemistry expertise to help the adoption of the product in the clinical lab. So, as a summary, I think point of care testing is a fast growing area in IVD, and next generation point of care has many promises, but at the same time, there's also challenges, of which I think technical challenges, clinical and regulatory challenges are the most important. And how do we solve and meet this challenge? I think two important things are here are very key. Why is innovation, and the other is partnership. And I really um, want to work with all of you here to address that. So here's my contact information, and uh, you're welcome to either email or call or use a WeChat to contact me, and uh, also con connect with me on LinkedIn. All right, and that's the end. Thank you. Do, do, do.